What are the best back exercises for muscle growth? To understand the answer, we first need to look at the anatomy of the back muscles. First off, it's worth understanding that the back is arguably the largest set of muscles with a variety of functions. Indeed, there's a lot of muscle groups involved and they all have different functions. So if we want to maximize growth of the back, we would want a selection of different exercises to effectively target different muscles within the back. In discussing anatomy, we'll simplify things and focus on the main functions of larger muscle groups. Indeed, many of the smaller muscle groups often have the same functions as larger muscle groups. For example, the teres major and the lats actually share many of the same functions. And so we can simplify things quite a bit by including these muscle groups together. First, the lats or latissimus dorsi and teres major are predominantly responsible for shoulder extension and adduction. The lower and middle traps are responsible for adduction of the scapula and upward rotation. Meanwhile, the rhomboids also contribute to adduction of the scapula, but instead contribute to downward rotation of the scapula. Besides some functions at the neck, the upper traps are basically only responsible for elevation of the scapula, and so some isolation work for the upper traps is likely warranted. The final major muscle of the back that we need to account for, that most people don't, is the erector spinae muscle, and it's responsible for spinal extension of a variety of sections of the spine. So let me give you a brief summary on each of these muscle groups and their functions. For the lats, we primarily want to target shoulder extension and adduction. For the lower, middle traps and rhomboids, we primarily want to target adduction of the scapula and upward and downward rotation of the shoulder blades. For the upper traps, we want to primarily target elevation of the scapula, like in a shrug. And finally, for the erector spinae muscle, we want to target extension of the spine. Compared to other muscle groups I've covered previously, like the triceps and shoulders, you might have noticed that there's a variety of functions here. So we'll definitely want a variety of exercises to target all of these muscle groups effectively, at least one per category. Another implication of this complex anatomy is that we likely want to involve a variety of grips when training your back. As I mentioned, your lats, for example, are responsible for both shoulder extension, but also adduction. And the grip you select, for example, on a lat pulldown, can impact the joint function you'll be targeting. For example, if you adopt an underhand grip, you'll be mostly targeting shoulder extension. Whereas if you adopt an overhand grip, you'll be mostly targeting shoulder adduction. So because the grip you use can impact which function you target, I would recommend using a variety of grips across the week. For example, try an overhand grip on Monday, an underhand grip on Wednesday, and a neutral grip on Friday. With that being said, if you only focus on the function of the muscle, you might think that a variety of exercises can work, and they do. However, we need to figure out which is the best exercise, and that's where criteria to gauge exercises by for muscle growth comes in. There's a few things to pay attention to. The first is that we definitely want to target one of the primary functions of the muscle we're trying to target. Across your whole exercise selection, we want to make sure we target a variety of functions. Oftentimes, a compound exercise can target multiple functions at once. The exercise we pick for hypertrophy should also be reasonably stable, as too much instability can compromise force production. Next, one big thing for hypertrophy is that we want to make sure the target muscle is the limiting factor in the exercise. When you look at something like a snatch grip RDL, or even an RDL more broadly, it isn't going to be your best choice for upper back growth. Why? Because plenty of other things can and usually do give out first. Like, for example, the hamstrings or the glutes or the adductors, which are actually responsible for lifting the weight off the ground and to lock out. Contrast this with something like a machine row, where the main functions involved are shoulder adduction or extension and scapular movement making it much more likely that your upper back will be the first thing to give out. This will make sure that your back muscles are being trained sufficiently close to failure to maximize hypertrophy. Next, we want to make sure whichever exercise we pick for hypertrophy is stretch friendly. Let me break down what that means. There are three components. First, we want to make sure that it places the target muscle group in that lengthened position. So we get a good stretch on the target muscle group in that exercise. The second thing is we want to make sure there's a decent amount of tension involved in that lengthened position. It shouldn't feel like there's no resistance when you're in that stretch position. Instead, it should feel challenging. As an example, compare the cable pullover to the dumbbell pullover. In the cable pullover, there is some resistance throughout the whole range of motion. However, the lift will typically be hardest around the midpoint of the lift to the shortened position. This is where most people will fail a cable pullover. In contrast, with a dumbbell pullover, the resistance is greatest when your lats are most lengthened, thus potentially offering more hypertrophy. Finally, the exercise we pick should also be length and partial friendly. Because most exercises that you train your back with 
have a pretty difficult resistance curve in that they're hardest in the shortened position, but quite easy in the lengthened position. And this is the opposite of what we desire for hypertrophy in our likelihood. We want to pick exercises where we can perform just a lengthened part of the movement to make that part of the range of motion more challenging and potentially promote greater muscle growth. Indeed, because the resistance curve on most back exercises like pull-ups, pull-downs, row variations, are all such that it's hardest in the shortened position, lengthened partials are probably most applicable in muscle groups like the back. We also want to pick exercises that minimize involvement of other muscle groups. For example, when you're picking between a bent over row and a machine chest supported row, the bent over row will involve more muscle groups that are required to stabilize the weight and the motion. In this case, the hamstrings, the glutes, the adductors will all be involved isometrically. Not only does this not add anything to stimulus for your upper back muscles, it also creates a little bit of additional fatigue for your hamstrings, glutes, and adductors. Wherever possible, we want to sit down or lie down and minimize the involvement of stabilizing muscle groups. This can also be seen in the cable pullover versus the dumbbell pullover. In the cable pullover, failure is often harder to gauge because you are standing up. Whereas in the dumbbell pullover, you can often tell when you failed simply because there are fewer moving parts. Here are a couple of bonus points to consider more carefully depending on your situation. The first is, is the exercise time efficient? Certain exercises are more time efficient than others. Typically, when you're doing a dumbbell exercise or a stack loaded machine exercise, this is more time efficient than something like a barbell exercise, where you have to set up the barbell, load up the plates, and then get started. The second point is micro loadability, or essentially, how small is the smallest increment that you can adjust load by week to week to progress. This isn't a huge issue for hypertrophy because you can simply add reps week to week before adding weight, which is what we call a double progression, but it is worth considering if you have the choice to pick an exercise that is more microloadable rather than not. So now that we understand what the back actually does in terms of functions and what some criteria for exercise selection are, let's break it down to three categories, lat focus, upper back focus, and upper trap focus. First, let's hit on the lats. The single best exercise for lat growth, in my opinion, is the dumbbell pullover, and here's why. First, as I mentioned earlier, it's substantially more stable than something like a cable pullover. Indeed, the only real moving part is to an extent your torso, but mainly just your shoulder and elbow joint. This makes it easier to gauge failure compared to a cable pullover where your hip position might be shifting around to make the lift easier. There are fewer stabilizing muscle groups involved, potentially reducing fatigue overall, and it's far easier to get a full stretch in a dumbbell pullover, I find, than in a cable pullover. Next, I think the lats will be the limiting factor. I know there have been claims made online about differences in internal leverage between, for example, the sternal chest and the lats, leading to the chest being the first thing to give out or get the main stimulus during a dumbbell pullover. However, it's worth pointing out that to my knowledge, there are no actual studies looking at hypertrophy showing that differences in internal leverage truly do lead to differences in hypertrophy. So while I would consider it to some extent in my exercise selection, I would value something like getting a full stretch in your lats and having a good deal of tension there more important as we do now have about a couple of dozen studies broadly showing that lengthened training is beneficial for hypertrophy. So we don't want to miss out on an exercise that offers these benefits in favor of something that we have no evidence for at present. Indeed, the dumbbell pullover is hugely stretch friendly. One, it offers the most resistance in that fully lengthened position. Two, the resistance gets easier as you shorten the lats and you don't even get to a fully shortened position. And therefore, it becomes a length and partial by design. Indeed, you get a full stretch on the lats at the bottom, but you only get about halfway up, about a halfway shortened position for the lats. The dumbbell pullover also very obviously targets one of the main functions of the lats, and that's shoulder extension. Now, the dumbbell pullover isn't the only good lat exercises. Here are a few honorable mentions. Honestly, I think most pull-down variations will do a decent job of training your lats, especially if you adopt a somewhat narrower grip in order to lengthen the lats even more, and if you try some lengthened partials. Indeed, one of the main shortcomings of pull-downs as opposed to pullovers is that the resistance curve gets harder and harder as you shorten the lats. For hypertrophy, we likely want the opposite. And so, by doing lengthened partials and only targeting the lengthened portion of the full range of motion, we can load the lat pull-down a little bit more heavily and make that lengthened position more challenging than it would usually be. You can use an overhand grip for more shoulder adduction or a neutral or underhand grip for more shoulder extension. Likewise, pull-ups are cool, but they suffer the same limitations as pull-downs, and they are slightly more fatiguing, relatively speaking, due to the amount of stabilizing muscle groups involved. For example, your abs might be involved to stabilize your spine, 
and they have a little bit less rep range flexibility. All right, for most people, while you can do sets of pull downs for 20 to 30 reps, if you wanted to, most people won't be able to do pull ups for 20 to 30 reps unless you're super jacked, which if you're watching this channel, you should be. It's worth mentioning that because of the complexity of the lats, I would get one to two lat focused exercises a weekend, at least with a variety of grips. Don't just stick to one grip, like a neutral grip, try a variety. Maybe you do overhand once a week and maybe you do underhand once a week. Maybe you do neutral once a week and overhand once a week. Just switch it up to a decent extent within the week. Next, let's move on for the best exercise for upper back growth. And here's what I think it is. I think the three best upper back exercises are the incline dumbbell row, the seal row, and the chest supported T-bar row. And here's why. The incline dumbbell row and the seal dumbbell row are both highly time efficient. You don't need to load a bar. If you have a seal bench at your gym, you don't need to set anything up. If you don't, you can use the incline dumbbell row instead. Set up properly, all three of these exercises offer a good stretch on the upper back. And by providing chest support, all three of these variations minimize fatigue generated in the adductors, hamstrings, lower back, glutes, etc. For the upper back, rowing variations are generally good. Just like with lat focused exercises, try and get one to two a week in at least. Again, just like with vertical pulling, try and get a variety of grips in. Don't just use the same grip every session. Since rows have the same limitation as pull downs and pull ups, where the resistance gets higher and higher as you reach that shortened position, there are a few things to keep in mind. One, consider using lengthened partials to make that lengthened stretch position more stimulating. Two, if you have access to prime machines, I've used prime row machines in the past, use them and selectively load the lengthened position. When it comes to rows, you kind of fall into one of three categories and here's what they are. You're either looking to maximize time efficiency, stimulus or minimize fatigue. If you're looking to minimize fatigue from rowing, try chest supported variations like the ones I just mentioned. If you're looking to maximize time efficiency, pick dumbbell or machine variations, specifically stack loaded machines where you don't need to load the plates on yourself. Finally, if you just want more stimulus out of your rows for your upper back, try exercises like the T-bar row or the chest supported T-bar row, which on account of the way the bar moves during a T-bar row, the resistance will be larger in that lengthened position compared to something like a barbell row. And so you might notice that generally something like a chest supported T-bar row offers a lot of the benefits for stimulus and minimizing fatigue, but it doesn't offer the benefits of time efficiency. You have to consider the trade-offs whenever you select your best exercise. And finally, the category no one actually wanted to hear about. What's best for your upper traps? I think the seated dumbbell shrug is the single best upper trap exercise, provided you have sufficiently heavy dumbbells around. Personally, I try and do seated dumbbell shrugs once to twice a week. They work great as a fatigue efficient, time efficient drop set. By sitting down, you're minimizing involvement and fatigue of the glutes, hamstrings, adductors, and lower back, stabilizing the weight. Likewise, using dumbbells minimizes time cost. You can simply grab the dumbbells, do a couple warm-up sets, and get straight into your lock set. No need to set up a barbell in a rack, load the plates, etc. Most shrug variations ultimately have very similar resistance curves, offer a pretty similar amount of stretch on the upper traps, and so any shrug variation really will do. That being said, a seated variation will minimize fatigue, using dumbbells or a stack-loaded machine will maximize time efficiency, so seated dumbbell shrugs or seated machine shrugs, if you have them, are great. If not, if you're not too strong, you can try cable shrugs for time efficiency. Anyways, that's the video. I think the dumbbell pullover, some sort of chest supported row, and some sort of seated dumbbell shrug will be your best options when it comes to the lats, the upper back, and the upper traps respectively. Put a lot of thought into this video, researched a lot of anatomy, hence the uh, anatomy chart in the background here. Left, right, it's all very confusing to a sports science doctor like myself. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please consider commenting, liking, subscribing. If there are any other muscle groups you want me to break down for you, as far as the best exercises according to the science, Leave a comment down below and I'll get to it. In the meantime, enjoy your day and I'll see you next time. Peace.